Hey everyone, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the compositor. If you're unfamiliar with node editors, and you haven't already watched my video on using them, you can check that video out here. The compositor is a post-processing tool that takes the outputs of your renders and manipulates them via a node tree before completing your render. By default, compositing is enabled in the post-processing section of the Render Properties tab in the Properties window. This means that your renders will be sent to the compositor by default, but if we go ahead and open up the compositing workspace, we'll see that Use Nodes is turned off. This means that although the render gets sent here, nothing happens with them, and they go straight to the output. If we want to enable the compositor, simply check Use Nodes. The default compositor node tree acts the same as when Use Nodes is unchecked. The main scene is rendered in this Render Layers tab and then sent to the composite output. It's what we add in between these two nodes where we can do some interesting things. The first thing I'm going to do is hit Render. As you can see, our render appears in the Render Layers node. This node lets you select a specific scene and a specific view layer to render. We'll come back to this node, but for now just know that this is our render source. You're outputting to a composite output node. When you render, this will populate the render result in our image editor. Whatever image gets sent to this socket will be sent to the image editor in the render result. Let's take a look at some other output types. Pressing Shift A and going to Output, add a viewer node. Connect the output of the renders layer node into this node. You should now see your result as a backdrop image. If you open the end panel and go to the view tab, you can adjust the settings for this background image. The easiest thing here to do is just to press fit. You can turn off this backdrop by clicking this button here at the top. In addition to making this image available as a backdrop, the input to this viewer node is sent to the viewer node result in your image editor. Another output node is the split viewer. Let's delete this viewer node and then add a split viewer node. We're going to connect the image to both inputs of the split viewer. But then we're going to go to Shift A, Color, Brightness Contrast, and we're going to add this to just one side. This lower image is being run through this Brightness Contrast node, so if I change the brightness, you'll see that's affecting one side of the image. I can slide the split back and forth using this factor, or change it to horizontal if I want. I'm going to change this now back to a regular viewer node. I'm going to split this connection using shift right click, and then drag from here. Another output is the file output node. Every time we render, a copy of this connection will be saved to the directory that we've notated here. With the file output node selected, in our end panel, if we go to the items tab and hit properties, we'll see we can change the path, the file format, a bunch of settings for that file, and then we can actually add additional outputs if we like. Each image that we connect here will be saved as a separate file each time we render. Do note that that file will be overwritten every time you render, not incrementally saved. If we take a look at our render layers node, we'll see that there are multiple outputs. Here we have image, alpha, depth, and noisy image because I have denoising turned on. Up until now, we've been using the image output to send to our output nodes. We could also send the alpha. Right now, there's no alpha data in this particular image because none of the scene is transparent all the way through. One way I could accomplish this is in the Render Properties tab, going to Film, and then marking Transparent. This means that anything that sees the sky will be completely transparent. So if I re-render this image, we see now that everything above the horizon is black, meaning it has zero alpha, and then everything below the horizon has an alpha of one, so it's not transparent. Another way we can make things transparent 
is by assigning the object the holdout shader. You'll see now that that particular rock has been marked with zero for its alpha channel. In the same way, if we plug in depth, it doesn't seem like we're seeing anything. But let's drop in converter math node, set the type to power, and start reducing the exponent. Once we get low enough, this node effectively acts as a high contrast node. And as we get the value low enough, we can start to see our objects. What we're seeing is a representation of their distance from the camera. If we go to the view layers property window, you'll see that there are multiple passes listed here. Each one of these enables an output on our render layers tab. So I could enable ambient occlusion, shadow, emission, and any other items I wanted. And that will enable those outputs on my render layer. Let's render this and see what this gives us. This is the shadow pass, the ambient occlusion pass, the direct light from glossy surfaces, the indirect light from glossy surfaces, anything that's emitting light, and then our undenoised image. You can turn these on and off as you need them. There are a lot of other inputs you can use as well. There are generated resources, like an RGB color or a value. There are external resources that you can add, like images and movie clips. There are also internal resources, like textures and masks. These can all be added to your node tree and combined as you need them. Here, I'll add an image. And I'll combine it with my render layer using a color mix node. Setting the type to multiply, you can see my two images have been multiplied together. If I were to create a texture, I could add that, and then use its value as the factor to combine them. The sky is really the limit with how you can combine inputs. Under the Add menu, the Color submenu is a selection of nodes for working with your color values. Functions like contrast and brightness, exposure, color balance, color correction, gamma, hue and saturation can all be added from here. You simply add them to your node tree in the order you want them applied. So I could add an exposure node, followed by a color balance node. The alpha over node is worth mentioning, as it's used quite a bit, and it might not be intuitive. Most programs that combine layers of images use a bottom-up type of stack, so that images that are above others show up above them. However, in the alpha over node, the lower image is placed in this first socket, and the higher image is placed in the bottom socket. So if I wanted to put this image over this white image, I would place it below it like this. Now this white background is placed here, and my image with its alpha channel is placed over it. The converter menu is a place for utility nodes. The four separate nodes take an image and break them into components like hue, saturation, value, red, green, blue, etc. And conversely, the four combined nodes do the opposite operation. This is great if you want to break down an image into components, work with one of those components, and then put them back together as an image. It would look something like this. Now with this node set up, I could adjust the red, green, blue, or alpha channel of this image separately from each other. So if I wanted to increase the exposure of just the red channel, I could do that. The RGB to BW node is simply a grayscale converter. The math node will allow you to take two values and perform a mathematical operation on them.
the filter menu contains nodes for adding filter effects to your node tree. Many blur functions have their own nodes, like bilateral blur, blur, bokeh blur, and directional blur. Here's the blur node. Filters like Soften, Sharpen, Edge Detection, etc. are in the Filter node. Simply choose the mode you want to use. The Glare node will let you add glare and bloom to your image if you have bright points, like this circle that's emitting light. Here is the Streaks mode, the Ghosts mode, the fog glow mode, and the star mode. The map menu has nodes for doing chroma keys and other sorts of mats. For instance, you could add an ellipse mask. I'm going to plug my ellipse mask into my output for a moment so I can see it. Then I can change the size to what I want. Now this mask will provide a value of 0 where it's black and 1 where it's white. I can use its output to drive other nodes. Here I'll add a blur node and I'll plug my mask into the size. And now everything that was white on my mask is blurry and everything that wasn't isn't. But maybe I wanted it the opposite. I could use an invert node from my color menu on my mask output. Changing one of my windows to an image editor and changing it to my viewer node, I'm going to go into mask mode. Here I'll add a circle mask. Back in my image, I'm going to go to Input, Mask, and choose the mask that I just created. I'll plug that into the mask input of my ellipse mask, and you see, because the mask type is Add, it has combined that mask and my ellipse mask. Masking can be a complex subject, so we're not going to cover any more of it in this video, but we will cover it in another one. The Map menu is also where you can access the Cryptomat functionality, that is also the topic of a whole other video. The Distort menu has nodes for altering the size and shape of image data. Cropping, distorting, rotating, scaling, and panning images can be done with these nodes. Also in the Distort menu are nodes for altering an image to work with camera tracking, lens distortion, and plane track deforming. The Group and Layout menus are very similar to all of the other node-based editors. If you want to check out how to work with those two menus, go ahead and check out the other video on node editors. I hope this overview of the compositor has been helpful and give you an idea of the types of things you can do in the compositor. So make sure to subscribe to the channel and give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. As always, thanks for taking time out of your day to watch my video. I hope it inspires you to do something awesome. I'll see you next time.